So uh, we have uh, Andrew Childs, who is the, uh, he's the co-director, he's uh, from the University of uh, Maryland. He's a co-director of the Joint Center for Quantum Info and CS uh, between uh, University of Maryland and NIST. Uh, so uh, Andrew is an is is an expert at quantum algorithms, and um, you know uh, as well as um, he's done this extensive work on the simulation of quantum systems. You know, uh, uh, quantum um, um, you know Hamiltonian simulations. So welcome, Andrew. Uh, we have Mike Marcus Greiner, who is um, who is a professor at uh, at Harvard as well. And um, he's, he's an experimentalist who, who works extensively on, on quantum simulation um, using uh, uh, with both Einstein condensates as well as ultra cold Fermi gases. Um, he, is, he was a, a MacArthur fellow and he's, uh, he's also uh, involved in this, uh, um, this work on observing quantum phase transitions from superfluid to to Mott installator in the Bose Hubbard systems. Um, then we have two uh, sort of uh, young stars in the field. There's, there's Monica Adelsberger from the University of Munich. Uh, welcome. And uh, um, so she um, she works on again on quantum simulation with ultra cold at atom gases and optical lattices. Um, Monica, you know, is uh, the winner of many various prizes, the Al Alfred Knoop Prize and the Klug uh, Wilhelm Science Award. So, uh, and then uh, Norman Yao, uh, great to have you here. Your, Norm is my colleague here at Berkeley in physics. Um, he's, uh, he's a protege of uh, Misha Lukin and like uh, Misha, he's make, making his transition from being a pure theorist to being both a theorist and an experimentalist. And uh, uh, Norm, of course, you know he's 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 been a, a Miller Fellow here at Berkeley, and uh, um, uh, you know with Packard Fellowship, etc. But most recently, he won the George Valley Prize for his work on non-equilibrium phases of matter. So, welcome everybody. And uh, let, let me just uh, say, you know, let's let's start with um, with uh, you know the. Um, with a few minutes for each panelist, just to give your, you know, your comments about Misha's talk, but also, um, you know, uh, also about the prospects for, for, uh, you know, for this sort of, uh, you know, the the scalability of um, of of these of these systems, and also, uh, um, um, you know, into into the future, both uh, and as well as. Um, as well as a comparison of uh, you know uh, of uh, of some of these um, of of the kind of uh, platform that uh, Misha spoke about you know what are its advantages and you know where do you how do you compare it to other platforms so um, if we can uh, um, and and of course um, and of course also as a you know comments on the on the actual algorithmic aspects of the of what uh, Misha spoke about so. Possibly, uh, um, who would like to go first? Maybe Andrew. Would you like to speak about the algorithmic aspect? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was a beautiful talk, and uh, you know, a really impressive system. And I think it was, you know, really, fun, really, uh, you know, interesting to hear about about um, the things that have been going on. Uh, you know, Misha, in your lab. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I thought it would be interesting. You know, maybe to talk a little bit about sort of. Um, the, the interaction between sort of what's being done in these systems and sort of computational ideas. Um, uh, you know, I guess sometimes maybe the, the line between sort of an analog, an analog quantum simulation uh, and a physics experiment is a little bit blurry. Um, you know, I guess we, we heard uh, sometimes about sort of, you know, realizing certain phases in the quantum simulator. But of course, you know, realizing a quantum phase, I guess, is something we don't, we don't expect a classical computer to do, but maybe it could answer, you know, computational questions about um, quantum phases, depending upon what the question is that we want to look at. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting to maybe talk a little bit in the panel, and I'd definitely like to hear, you know, what, what Misha and everyone has to say about this, um, uh, sort of making links between what's going on in, in these kinds of um, quantum simulation experiments and, you know, CS theory. Um, so, you know, what are the sort of computational questions that we can try to um, address with simulators? 
Um, you know, certainly the dynamics of the kinds of systems that you're realizing are, are classically hard in some sense, but, um, you know, what are the kinds of questions we would like to answer? I guess we can ask questions about like, um, you know, measuring correlation functions in the ground states of these systems, or, uh, you know, maybe trying to identify like, where is the value of some parameter in the Hamiltonian at which a phase transition occurs? I guess maybe those are the kinds of questions one could answer, but I guess, you know, it would be helpful for me as a person who wants to think about algorithms to know sort of what you think about, you know, the, um, the interesting questions to ask about these systems that we can phrase as kind of crisp computational questions where we can try to compare what we can do in these, in these quantum systems um, and, and, you know, what we could maybe try to do with classical computers, but, but maybe you could argue would be hard. Um, and, and I think also it would be interesting to think about sort of like um, places where a computational perspective maybe could help guide what's going on in experiments, you know, like, um, I guess you talked about sort of, you know, for, for realizing fault tolerance, the need to maybe develop new ideas about how, how we would do that to make fault tolerance more uh, realizable. But I guess, um, you know, it seems like maybe there's an opportunity to develop new theoretical tools that could help us understand um, what are the capabilities of analog simulators, you know, how we make them robust, how we understand when their output is correct. Um, so I, I think it would be interesting to look for places where, where maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of CS theory perspective could help to address those kinds of questions. Okay, maybe I'll stop there. That's great, yeah. Thanks, uh, Andrew. So um, I don't know how you'd like to do this. Misha, would you like to speak to these or should we just go through all the panelists and then and come back to you? I think we should just go around the spot. Okay, okay, great. So uh, who would like to, to, to go next? Uh, um, I'm happy to, I can go. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll try to mention kind of four questions that I think might be sort of fun for the panel to sort of discuss together with Misha. Um, and I think, I mean, again, I mean, the talk was, I think Umesh put it very well. I think one is irrationally excited about so many aspects of the talk. I mean, it's just really exciting progress on so many fronts. But maybe just a couple that um, Misha emphasized and I wanna sort of mention as directions that one can think about. So one thing that Misha emphasized near the beginning of his talk is this idea that there exist maybe physical mechanisms like the blockade, which from a microscopic perspective are more robust you know, to certain things. For example, to the motion of the atoms, to a little bit of extra jitter here and there. And one can ask an interesting question in my opinion, which is, do there exist you know, a class of you know, interactions that happen in nature like the blockade? where one can naturally get robustness to certain types of error, noise, fluctuations that exist within experimental platforms? And does that robustness maybe at a fundamental level mean that those, you know, making gates in sort of a long-term digital vision, does that mean that one should expect that those types of microscopic, you know, interactions will enable just better gate fidelities, you know, at a fundamental limit? And there, I think it'd be really interesting to hear Monica and Marcus's perspective eventually on the balance between you know, things like blockade-based gates versus other neutral atom-based ideas for implementing gates in, for example, optical lattices. Is there some complementarity? Are there some intrinsic advantages that one sees in one versus the other? Another thing that Misha mentioned in the middle of his talk, and or maybe something that combines you know, the two pieces of Misha's talk, and also, you know, kind of pays tribute to what Andrew was talking about is, you know, what Misha showed us in the topological spin liquid section is that in some sense, the experiment was performing surprisingly good, you know, surprisingly better than maybe one would naively expect from a theoretical phase diagram perspective. And that's very special to me. So I wonder, you know, there's this classic idea of encoding solutions of really hard problems in ground states and then trying to adiabatically prepare such ground states. But usually as theorists, we're taught that, you know, for most of the really hard problems, there are prohibitive challenges in terms of the way gaps close, first orderness of the transition. But is it possible that the experiment is kind of telling us that, you know, one should be a little bit more bold and cavalier, and maybe one doesn't necessarily directly try to prepare into the phase, but even looks at nearby phases where there can be a metastable solution nearby, which one could sort of adiabatically get into and get stuck in. And that maybe kind of combines these two aspects. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is sort of the last thing that, that Misha did talk about as well in the outlook, 
which is this possibility of sort of moving things around dynamically, which also seems extremely special to me. And there, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to hear a purview from, you know, Umesh and others who are super involved, you know, in these, you know, foundational ideas of how one could demonstrate things like quantum advantage in an interactive fashion. Because I think in principle, what Misha is demonstrating is the possibility of actually moving things around and now performing intermediate measurements and then moving things back in kind of a non-destructive way that allows entanglement between the other degrees of freedom to be maintained. And I do think that there's both science there at the level of things that Adam Nahum and many others are thinking about with measurement-based phase transitions, but also you know, some interesting interplay with quantum advantage protocols that people like Umesh and Tom Vidic have thought about quite a bit. So certainly that would be something I'd love to hear about. Great, thanks, Norm. That's a lot to cheer on. Maybe uh, Monica or Marcus who would. Yeah, but maybe I could, uh, uh, I could talk real quick um, uh, just about. Um, uh, um, it's really exciting to see so um, how the quantum simulation in the NISC era kind of um, how they give us possibilities already to um, address really hard questions and study things that are really uh, hard uh, to compute. Let me maybe give a little overview of these um, of these atom platforms real quick. So, so as you know, uh, um, um, know, one uh, famous example for quantum simulation is bosonic atoms in optical lattices, right? Like, like the superfluid mod that you already mentioned. Um, um, there's um, still a lot of development in that field. For example, uh, you can uh, um, make more programmable systems also um, measure things like integument entropy, um, many body purity, all kind of um, things like that. And if you're talking about quantum advantage, of course, for bosons, you really want to go to non-equilibrium situations. And mm -hmm. um, so, for example, uh, um, um, studies of, of NBL um, um, and quantum thermalization, things like that. Um, um, it, um, it's quite amazing if you have more than 20, 30 atoms and do dynamics over many tunneling times, and we have seen coherence times of hundreds, many hundred uh, tunneling times, you get a pretty large uh, quantum volume there. Um, so that's bosons, a fairly active field, also with gauge fields, uh, um, as Monica will, will uh, uh, probably also mention. And then, um, 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 right, so as you um, all know, the second platform, uh, like Wittberg, uh, Adams that Misha was uh, talking about um, um, has some similarities, but it's actually even more programmable. And as he mentioned, we're working on really um, addressing uh, um, all the atoms individually to uh, have a very wide uh, programmability there. Um, it's also a bit simpler and faster, and that high repetition rate actually makes a big difference. Um, but I do want to mention uh, um, one other platform real quick, which is quite special, and I think there are many open, interesting questions, and um, it's not really quite understood yet how to really think about these systems from a quantum information point of view, um, and that is fermionic atoms. So as you know, if you put fermionic atoms into optical lattices, uh, you realize the Fermi Hubbard model, which is a really famous, um, powerful fundamental model in condensed matter physics. And it's uh, deceivingly simple. You can write it in half a line, but um, mm -hmm. but even uh, but but it's really hard to understand what the physics is. And of course, you can as you change parameters, you get yet completely different situations. And uh, um, it's fascinating to me how difficult, uh, like how can it be that such a simple model has so much richness uh, and is so hard uh, uh, to compute? And so this is one very active. Um, uh, field in many groups. Um, for example, we've seen antiferromagnetic uh, uh, phases uh, and uh, studied the doped Hubbard model uh, where we observed uh, like string patterns, for example, or polarons directly so that you can really see this intricate interplay between charge and spin degrees of freedoms. Um, a lot of these experiments, you know, uh, you may be able to argue maybe this is already in some kind of quantum advantage regime. Uh, certainly, it's not possible to to compute these uh, 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 things. Uh, but to me, it's more important. You know, is it really useful? Um, and there, I'm uh, I'm really um, excited about the prospects. Um, for example, we are in the middle of a major upgrade to to lower. 
temperatures to even much lower temperatures and have a much wider class of models you can program, for example, all kind of different lattice structures um, and things like that. And so there uh, is a lot of exciting things to come. Um, from a uh, kind of quantum information point of view, it's fascinating to me, how can it be that such a simple model is so hard and what does that mean? And maybe uh, uh, um, I just want to give that message to, to inspire some theorists maybe also, um, um, like how do you understand these, these, these fermionic models from a quantum information uh, um, and theory point of view? Of course, as you know, um, um, a quantum system them of fermion maps onto a bosonic or spin model via the uh, Wigner transform. But the amazing thing is that um, uh, you can have a totally local fermionic model that maps onto a highly non-local uh, spin or Bose problems. Uh, scalable quantum machines, of course, are local. So if I implement the fermionic degree of freedom um, um, natively on such a machine, then this local model uh, studies models that would map on highly non-local uh, spin or or Bose uh, problems. And so, to me, um, that seems an interesting question. If if uh, if there's maybe some important power that lies in that kind of um, um, in that mapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, to wrap. Uh, this up so it, um, it's kind of funny sometimes it's a bit, um, you know a bit overwhelming uh, what the challenges are it feels a bit hyped sometimes or you know is it um, will it be hard to control an exponentially large Hilbert space um, and so on but then um, on those days if I then go into the lab and I see that you know we can really use a handful of atoms and these atoms following very simple rules are doing things that no supercomputer can compute um, that is certainly very motivating and so uh, this is a really exciting time for quantum simulation to really um, ex um, explore these kind of questions great uh, thanks thanks marcus uh, monica you've been waiting patiently so uh, <laughs> i'd love to hear what you no have problem to say. Uh, thanks for for having me in in this distinguished panel <laughs> So um, yeah, I just add a little bit. So many, many things have already been said. So I will just add a few more ideas um, without actually taking too much time. And um, I want to pick up a few ideas that have been already mentioned in particular that analog uh, simulations have already been very successful. And it is very interesting, of course, to think of uh, possible ways to answer interesting questions in order to use this um, to demonstrate some quantum advantage. And it seems to me that indeed this non-equilibrium phenomena or quench dynamics can be one way. And I think what I have in mind there is that this interplay of trying to understand our quantum many body systems better and better, like now, um, as was mentioned also in the talk, that we can reach 200, 300, 400 atoms. Um, we can also try to de devise new, more efficient algorithms, which maybe we can use to describe the dynamics, which previously were hard to develop just because we don't have a very good handle on estimating the error of certain approximations that we make. So there can be, I think, an interesting interplay between uh, the experiments, the analog simulations, and the theory, on the other hand, in order to learn more from a quantum information point of view about what degrees of freedom of the quantum anybody system are relevant for this for the dynamics that we are seeing and i think um, maybe this also ties in a little bit with the um, idea of using fermions so maybe um, as part of this um, one could think of developing hybrid approaches where if we um, are able to control fermions very well let's say in the lattice that we can um, run parts of the algorithm on a quantum machine where we, I don't know, eliminate the sign problem, let's say, because we can use the fermions and, and the lattice very efficiently and combine it with some classical algorithm in order to solve um, problems more efficiently. And um, this also um, comes uh, to one of the questions I would like to pose to everybody. Um, so I think the idea of using fermions is very appealing in, in our uh, type of platforms. And um, it is an interesting question question um, to answer if fermions can be a way to reach quantum advantage for certain models faster. If we think of simulating lattice gauge theories uh, where gauge fields are coupled to fermionic matter, 
Of course, there are certain mappings on to other models, simpler models. We can integrate out fermionic degrees of freedom in order to describe these models. But eventually, I, I would like to understand if, if, if maybe fermions are more efficient in solving some of these some of these questions. And then going a little bit away from the analog simulation towards the digital approach, um, I also would like to pick up the idea of developing um, the platform. So trying to understand um, what are the, the current limitations can maybe um, dynamically reconfigurable atoms in a, in a normal optical lattice using collisional gates uh, in, in, in contrast to Rydberg excitations, let's say, um, be, be better, like can we reach higher fidelities um, if we use that? Should we maybe think of different types of gates? Should we uh, rather make use of multi-qubit gates in order to develop maybe more resource efficient algorithms and protocols uh, where we can work with fewer atoms and then maybe we don't need as high fidelities. And then the other question would be about, um, well, crosstalk, but it's a bit less important about error mitigation. So we have um, talked about fault tolerant uh, quantum computation, but then, okay, there, there are several ideas out there, but it seems to me that uh, for now, of course, all of our platforms have very different limitations in terms of fidelities and the, fault tolerance schemes may not be suited to protect us against the errors that we have in the in the experiment. So against atom loss, against um, spontaneous emission, defacing, and so on. So I think this is another interesting question to, to explore. Great, thanks. Thanks, Monica. So there's a lot, uh, um, Misha, for you to chew on there and respond to. Can I add one more piece to it? You know, I'll ask a very naive question, which, uh, uh, which you can just just uh, bat away very quickly and then get on to the meat of these questions. So, so there were, there was this um, you know great robustness of this um, of the Rid, Rid, Rydberg uh, blockade. So, given that uh, you know uh, given that you have such a such a robust uh, mechanism underlying your interactions, so what is you know why uh, what is the bottleneck on the fidelities? You know. I, as you know, naively, I'm just thinking, well, if it's a robust interaction, shouldn't, it, shouldn't the fidelities be larger? Yeah, so yeah, this, okay. You know, there are no simple questions to mesh. So it's, you know, it can itself, you know, take a, you know, couple of hour discussions, but, you know, but basically when I mean that it's, that this interaction is robust, what I mean by that, for example, is that it's relatively insensitive to things like motion. So for example, in most of our experiments, we don't cool atoms to the ground state, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, uh, and you know, they are not sensitive to exact position, for example, if there is position fluctuation. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are other um, uh, contributions. Um, uh, so for example, the Rydberg states uh, have a finite lifetime. And this lifetime is relatively long. It's, you know, it's, you it can be a couple of hundred of microseconds, but it is, you know, it contributes to, you know, finite uh, uh, fidelity. So one other um, uh, contribution is connected to basically things like, you know, light shifts that you basically are that are kind of this energy level shifts induced by, by laser beams, you know, so all of these things at the end kind of add up. And, you know, I think we understand, we believe they understand the leading mechanisms, but, you know, of course you sort of solve the first order mechanisms and then there will be other mechanisms, right? And um, I think it is kind of uh, interesting to actually compare since the, you know, uh, Marcus and Monica, uh, you know, brought up the kind of the ideas of, for example, using atoms in the ground states, like basically collisional interactions. And, you know, the quantum gates between atoms with uh, collisional interactions have been demonstrated, you know, with very quite reasonable fidelity. So, uh, and, you know, it's interesting to compare this, the, these approaches. So I would say the kind of, I mean, the, the opportunities offered by these bosonic and fermionic statistics are very special. Uh, and, you know, 
in our case, you know, we don't, you know, like we do everything so fast that, you know, there is a lot of motion is frozen. You know, we just can implement speed models. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it's kind of not as rich a system, but I would say there are maybe three things which make this kind of recent developments with this Rydberg arrays uh, a kind of special. One of them is that these experiments are just very fast. They're much faster than compare, you know, than comparable, you know, like experiments based on BC. And, you know, I think, you know, this is not, you know, I think that's an interesting challenge for, let's say, for optical lattice simulators to speed them up. And I think there are some ideas, I know, in Marcus's group, how, how to do it. But, you know, that's kind of, when you enable these experiments run at a high rep rate, it kind of improves greatly, in cool, it, it improves the quality of life of junior scientists in the lab, you know? The second, you know, the second thing is that, you know, the interactions between the Rydberg atoms are very strong. And so as a result, they are very forgiving to many of the, you know, things. So basically if your interaction are at the kilohertz level, I mean, you have to work very, very hard to just, you know, even if atoms are well isolated, you know, to basically, if you want to, you know, look at like third or fourth digits in fidelity. And, you know, I think the other, um, the other thing is that, you know, at least kind of relatively speaking, these Rydberg arrays are probably at the moment a bit more programmable compared to, to, uh, to optical lattice thesis. Then again, there are some opportunities where I think these other experiments, you know, can, can be pushed forward, you know? So this is basically, you know, this is not, you know, this is a multi-dimensional parameter space, right? And, you know, I think there are, you know, in, in some, and it's for sure, it's kind of, you know, to, if you have, you know, a fermionic degree of freedom, it's much better to directly implement it in, a, in, in an analog way, you know, uh, as opposed to the, just try to simulate it through, through qubits, you know, which is extremely costly. So, but, you know, one thing I should kind of, and maybe moving on to some of the other things, which was kind of touched upon, so there is no question that quantum dynamics is probably the kind of the most obvious kind of first frontier where, you know, you know, like we can really use these systems, you know, you can call them experiments, simulators, computers, but, you know, this is an area where basically, you know, you kind of, you, you basically go to like, you know, to the corners of Hilbert space where no one has ever been. And, you know, in, in, with these kind of methods, you know, if you go there, you are bound to make discoveries. And it's certainly in our work, whenever we try, you know, some kind of like, you know, something even mildly non-equilibrium, we would always discover something, new. you know. So we talked about this, you know, spin liquid being a kind of metastable state, which indeed kind of opens up an intriguing prospect. So there might be much larger sets of Hamiltonians, which you, if you prepared state will protect it, you know. It doesn't have to be, you know, a ground state. A lot of things around us are very stable. A piece of diamond, right? You know, is, you know, is an example, right? You know, so, um, but the, but maybe the thing which actually I would kind of connecting to Andrew's uh, kind of excellent points, you know, the kind of maybe the interesting kind of theoretical kind of you know, conceptual challenge is how we sort of, you know, like at this dynamics, you know problems you often create this kind of messy entangled states you know what do we look at you know what kind of observables you know should we look at how we know that our simulators are working well you know and um i, I think you know you know for example the, the opportunity i think the quite special opportunity is also along the line that monica mentioned you know this kind of opportunity where you will combine for example analog simulators with some digital circuits, you know, where you can, for example, look at things like, an, you know, entanglement entropy, kind of similar to Marcus's experiments a few years ago, but also look at things like entanglement spectrum. I think they are all now within the reach. In this topological observables, where you can maybe use some ancillas to sort of probe some non-local, you know, degrees of freedom, you know, all of these things, you know, all of these are, you know, kind of opportunities, right? And so some of these observables are extremely non-trivial. And I think kind of developing methods to kind of interrogate these systems, I think is very, very interesting challenge. 
So uh, on a kind of on a on the other side, you know, like kind of connecting to try to connect it, these things to computer science, I've, I I think one could also think about new ways to implement um, quantum algorithms. And you know, the the brief discussion that I had about this, you know, basically about solving this maximum independent set, you know, was an example of that, you know. Uh, so, and, you know, you could say, well, okay, so you sort of worked very hard and we just showed quadratic speed up, but okay, I mean, this is sort of, that's a point where we try to at least chip away at kind of, of this, you know, basically, you know, can we find, how can we find, you know, next Shor's algorithm, right? You know, uh, there are some instances which will be amenable to the speed up, which are, you know, which is substantial, you know? And I think that's where, you know, base and like, in, at least in the near term, we have to use some kind of co-design. We have to use this efficient qubit encoding. Otherwise, we just don't have a, a chance to really explore this, you know, you know, these algorithms and the kind of, you know, the all the, the, the kind of meaningful explorations would require, you know, hundreds of qubits and large circuit depth. So I think we have to be kind of, you know, very creative in terms of how we map, you know, the kind of interesting computational, classical computational problems to quantum algorithms and then to this kind of hardware platforms. But I think there is a very, very special opportunity uh, uh, to kind of, uh, to explore this, this, this kind of things. So, so, uh, so yeah, so I guess I mentioned, you know, uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, a few things. I mean, kind of in connection to norms, um, uh, points, yeah I, I, yeah, I do think that, you know, thinking about mechanisms such as blockade, you know, which could enable robust, inter I think this is, would be very, very interesting and useful. And also, you know, kind of extending them to things like multi-qubit gates, they can, you know, provide very, very powerful, right? Of course, you need a certain degree of non-locality then, but you know, I think we have it, you know, in some of the systems. So I also completely agree about sort of opportunity of, of going, going beyond the ground state physics, you know, for example, you know, can we prepare, you know, some error correcting cold states, which should then protect even if they are not the ground states of the Hamiltonian and maybe interrogate, you know, manage, you know, combine this, you know, Hamiltonian protection with some kind of, you know, anyone, you know, um, kind of pairing mechanisms. I think these are all, you know, these are the things you know, at the end, I think we would need breakthrough among, uh, along one of these directions to really build large scale quantum processors. That's, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, convinced about this, yeah. But I think there are also, every challenge is an opportunity. I think this is a very, very special time where we can really explore these things. That's what's very, very special. Great, thanks, um, thanks, Misha. So I think we are we are getting close to the end of our time. So maybe uh, if there are any other comments on the panel, if, uh... maybe I can just ask a question that kind of I suspect Marcus, Monica, Misha, and I both have or all have for Umesh and Andrew. Um, so you know, there's been this discussion I think come up throughout the panel about the possibility of you know thinking about dynamics and then after you do some dynamics, measuring some correlation functions and the possibility that, you know, that is really hard. Is there, you know, you know, we've heard examples of, you know, things where there's, you know, provable, you know, quantum advantage on underlying some of these, you know, important sampling type questions. But at the same time, you know, as Misha and Marcus and Monica emphasize, I do think that, you know, quantum dynamics is a place where these systems truly shine. And I'm wondering whether or not is there some prospect for the ability to sort of, you know, harness some of these correlation function measurements or susceptibility measurements, you know, in kind of a sharp advantage way? Or is it really that, you know, everything that one does, dynamics, measure cool stuff, can never be considered something, you know, that will be provably quantum advantage? Maybe a naive question, sorry. Um. Do you want to take it or shall I say well, something? Well, I mean, I think, you know, um, yeah, maybe I can say something, and but um, 
I mean, I, you know, I think generally speaking, you know, once you can sort of uh, run quantum dynamics, I mean, you're going to run into problems that are sort of have the full power of, of quantum computing in them. You'll get sort of BQB hard problems, right? So I think, you know, already just measuring local observables, you know, you don't need to even go to sort of correlation functions, you know, already just measuring local observables of, of sort of, you know, um, uh, all but sort of the simplest quantum dynamics will will be, you know, will be a BQB hard problem. So, uh, so in that sense, I mean, when you say provably hard, I mean, of course, we don't know how to prove that, you know, quantum computers can, you know, can't generically be simulated classically, but sort of that would be the only thing keeping us from, from knowing that, that those kinds of problems are hard, I, I would think. Yeah. Does, does that sound reasonable? Yeah, maybe what I think, maybe I can amplify a little bit norms kind of idea. So, and for example, like, so we know that contracting like two deep apps, uh, you know, is hard. You know, can this be used as a basis to really make you know some some sharper statements? But perhaps this could also inspire better understanding of that. Maybe can inspire new quantum algorithms actually to be implemented. So maybe that's maybe that's more sort of one way to think about it. You no, know, it's a question. You know. so so maybe if, if I can take a shot at it. So it, it seems to me there are two, two different ways to look at it, right? So one is, can we show quantum advantage in the sense of saying, um, here's something that you can, you can actually accomplish which, for which there's, a, there's some, some level of proof that you couldn't accomplish it classically. And that I, you know, that I believe, um, uh, you know, should be possible. And so, you know, we'd have to look at these, the specific capability, you know, um, adapt, adapt those schemes to this, uh, to what can be done easily in this, in this particular platform. But then there, there's, a, there's a different question whether, whether you can get an advantage on something useful, right? And that, that may be the other thing to think about. And, and there again, I think there, there, there are two different ways you can look at it, right? Is it, is it useful computationally? And that's, that's something that we'd like to get to eventually. But in the, in the meantime, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's another question you could ask in terms of the dynamics, which is what would it mean to, to be able to simulate the dynamics which is useful not not necessarily from a computational viewpoint per se as a as a as a well defined computational problem, but from you know but from a science viewpoint, which is which is what I think Misha was 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 uh, was getting at, right? So so um, I mean I you know it se it seems to me there was there were there was some idea that yes there's a you know there's there's a, there's, uh, there's an advantage to be had in terms of something useful in the sense of scientific discovery. And is, is there a way to spell, sort of spell that out even more and say, okay, here, here's what you can get at with dynamics that you couldn't get at with stable states and you know, so. It's basically to quantify the scientific discovery. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, well, or, or, or just intuitively, you know, so, sort of say, well, you know, one's, one's digging in this direction because one expects to find these kinds of things, you know, that, that's the... Yeah, I mean, it's often the, the, the kind of issue, maybe what I would kind of like to sort of in along these lines, um, one challenge, or maybe it's not, it's both challenges and an opportunity, is such that, you know, once you, in this kind of dynamics problems, often once you sort of know what to expect, mm -hmm. can often be very, you know, creative and clever to come up with the good way to describe it, you know? If you don't know what to expect, I mean, you are basically lost in this huge Hilbert space, right? Um, but, you know, for instance, one of the, in the sequences we discovered these revivals, uh, these quantum anybody scars, you know, once you know that they are there, you, of course, could try to, you know, build a clever, you know, kind of matrix product or net, tensor network state, and you can, you know, test if it works. But if you did not know that, you know, you wouldn't, you know, you would never, you know, no, never do it, you know, is it kind of, is it sort of quantum advantage? Yeah, on one hand, yes, on one hand, kind of, you know, not necessarily in terms of computation, but I think for science, it is an advantage, right? So, yeah. 
And um, you know, and I think we I think we just need more examples of this type, and we need more ways to think about mm-hmm. to, to to figure out how to think about you know uh, these things. And you know, it could be that kind of in a near term, the most exciting science would be new insights how to build bigger and better quantum machines, right? Yeah. Which is not too bad, also, right? So you know, great. But thank you. Thanks. Uh, on that note, uh, thanks a lot, Misha, for a wonderful talk. And, and thanks, um, Andrew, Monica, Norm, and Marcus for a great discussion. And, uh, thank you, Mesh, for organizing this whole. You know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks very much. Great. Much you all next week. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Mm-hmm.